you are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. Welcome to By the Book. This is Alan Griffith, your host for this episode, episode 50. Glad you're with us today. I want to begin this episode by going back to some comments I made at the end of episode 49, and I want to clarify what I was getting at, and I want to challenge you to think about this matter. And what I was talking about at the end, we've been discussing uh, in that session the human spirit and being born again and such. And at the end, I made reference to this idea that I haven't heard promoted in quite a while. It used to be very, very common. Maybe it still is in some circles, but I have heard it uh, a lot on some of the kind of TV ads where preachers are coming on and, and talking to people about getting saved. And then they are using this expression, something like this. You need to tell God that you know you're a sinner and you want Jesus to come into your heart. Well, I want to tell you something. That is not good instruction. Uh, I grew up, as some of you might know, a Roman Catholic. I actually became Roman Catholic when my mother married my stepfather. He was Catholic. She became Catholic as a young person then. I became Catholic, uh, got involved in the Catholic Church, <clears throat> became an altar boy, uh, I was an altar boy at the 11 o'clock Mass of St. Norbert's Roman Catholic Church in Paoli, Pennsylvania for uh, a number of years as a young person, and then I am uh, so grateful that I was invited to an old-fashioned tent revival, heard the gospel preached, realized I was lost. Uh, the invitation was given. I raised my hand. They sang the wonderful invitation hymn, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling and after battling for four verses, uh, I went forward. Uh, my wife, who was a girlfriend to me then, who had invited me to the tent meeting, uh, she walked that aisle with me. That's why she invited me to that tent meeting that I might get saved. And then we, of course, ended up married, and, and I'm so grateful for that. But that night I got saved. And uh, what I want you to know that is, if somebody had said to me at the end of that service when I went forward, or in any other setting, if they'd have said to me, now, here's what you need to do to be saved. You need to believe that you are a sinner. Well, I already believe that. I knew it was a sinner. There was no doubt in my mind. Nobody had to convince me of that. So they'd say to me, well, you need to believe you're a sinner. I'd say, okay, I got that. And then they say, now you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, you know, I could have prayed and done that very thing. Dear Jesus, or, or Heavenly Father, send Jesus into my heart, or dear Jesus, I, I invite you into my heart. I could have done that, and I want to tell you something. It would have meant absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. The, the idea of God coming into us, uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory, or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're going to get into that stuff a little bit. But, you know, that is what I would dare to call a byproduct of salvation. That is not what you do to get saved. You don't say, Jesus, please to come into my heart. If you are saying that to children, and often that's what we do, or I hear people do when they're ministering to children in Sunday school, Bible school, whatever it might be, they're saying, oh, boys and girls, you need to come and ask Jesus to come into your heart. No, no, no. To get saved, you have to get to the cross. And you ask, well, then, you know, then we say that you're a sinner and Jesus died for you. Yes, you need to get to the cross, but you need to understand what is happening on that cross that you are coming to Jesus Christ and, and listen, and in coming to him, you are rejecting everything else you ever trusted in or hoped in to get you saved. 
In other words, when you get saved, there is a rejection of a lot of other things, and there is an acceptance of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross as your only hope. It's the shedding of his blood for our sins. That is our only hope, plus nothing. If as a young person, I was 18 when I got saved, if I had gone forward and they had said to me, well, you know, you're a sinner. Yes, Jesus died for you. Yes. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Let's pray. You ask Jesus to come into your heart. I could have done that. And you know what? I could have continued believing all of the Roman Catholic doctrine, and I would have been lost. And there are other people who who go to church, and, and they would say, yes, they believe they're, they're sinners and that Jesus died for them. But that's not what they're really depending on. That's kind of a foundational concept but they're hoping they'll get to heaven because they're good or they give money or they've been baptized or whatever it might be. And then maybe they're going to ask Jesus to come into their heart. Listen, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to emphasize it. Some people won't like it, but I want to tell you, if you and I don't get this truth right, there's going to be a whole lot of people who think that just asking Jesus to come into their heart is what means what it means to be saved. And it's wrong it's wrong. You got to get to the cross. And again, you see that shed blood and you say, my hope is in the shedding of that blood, period. I'm claiming that. That's what I'm believing in. I'm trusting Christ and what he did on that cross. And when I express myself to God, if I do in prayer, I express myself, that is my my testimony to God. Lord, Father, I am claiming Jesus Christ as my Savior based on the shed blood of Calvary and then the assurance of him coming forth from the grave and resurrection to prove that, in fact, on that cross, he won the victory for me. I can be saved by faith in him. That's what it is. That's salvation. And somebody, when they get saved, especially a religious person, must come to grips with the fact that they have to reject everything else they ever hoped in. And that's hard for a lot of people. Oh, I've been religious a long time. I've gone to church a long time. I was baptized. I had First Holy Communion. I had whatever it might be. We can go through the whole list. And all of that has to be rejected. No, I reject it all. I come to that cross. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. That's what I'm claiming for salvation. That's what I'm claiming. You know, when the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We could talk a lot about that verse too, but I want to suggest to you that that call is not a prayer to Jesus for you to get saved. That term call is like laying claim. It's laying claim. It's appealing to the cross. That's the idea. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, you are appealing to the value of the cross. Say, that's what I'm hoping in. That's what I'm trusting in. Listen, that's salvation. And I fear that seeing so many people today who profess to get saved, oh yeah, I did that or whatever, I wonder sometimes if people ever got saved because they didn't understand where they really had to go to in their faith. And where you need to go to is the cross. And not easy for some people. Not easy for some people. But you cannot have the Lord Jesus Christ plus anything. You have to reject everything else. Not easy. You have to reject everything else. To turn away from that's what Paul did when he talks about, you know, he used to be a Pharisee, he used to have all these things going for him, and then he says, and I rejected it all for Christ. That's what you need to do to get saved. And if you're here today and you say, Well, that's that's not what I did. Well, bless your heart, man. Get on your knees and get saved today. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. The resurrection is the testimony of God that what Jesus did on the cross worked, and what you need to do is believe. That's where you put your faith and trust. 
salvation. How wonderful it is. Don't confuse people with a softened message. Don't confuse people. I mean, is it easy? Oh, it's easy because Christ did all the work. That's what makes it easy. But it ought not be what is sometimes called an easy believism, where you don't come to grips with your own life and your own sin and your own phony beliefs and so on. No, you have to, again, I'll say it, reject everything else. Put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone. So I needed to say those things, and I hope you'll think about them. So we have been talking in this context about salvation and uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. When you get saved, there is a new birth. You are born again. You now become a child of God. And for the first time, that's when you become a child of God. You hear people say, talking about the world, oh, we're all the children of God. No, we're not. The devil is the prince of this world. And if you've never been saved, you're a prince of the devil. I don't care if you go to church every single day of the year. You are still under the leadership of the devil until you turn from all that and you turn to Jesus Christ alone and you get saved. And when you get saved, that is when you become a child of God. Now, there are things that happen once you trust Christ as your Savior. And we're talking about uh, the human spirit, and I want to remind you of this challenge. I think we've already taken note of uh, the idea that the Holy Spirit uh, is the agent, if you will, of giving eternal life, the agent of regeneration. He's the one who gives us the eternal life. He works and, and uh, joins, as it were, unites with our human spirit. We are born again. We are now going to live forever. If we die, we go to heaven. Eventually, the new earth will be on the new earth. And we saw in Romans eight sixteen that when you get saved, The Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit, your spirit being the deepest part of you. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Now, one of the the blessings that comes along is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to read that because Paul is going to relate this not just to our body, but to our human spirit. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. We're going to get to that and talk more about that. But also, then he says, and in your spirit, which are both body and spirit, which are God's. Human spirit, the deepest part of your being. Now, let's just talk a little bit more about the human spirit, some of the things that the Bible says about it. Uh, Very important, very helpful, as you and I try to understand. So who am I? Uh, How do I function? And uh, do I understand uh, what God says about me and my being? Isaiah 26, 9 says this, that we seek God with our spirit. Now, again, our total being is involved. Emotion is involved. Thinking is involved. All those kinds of things. But underneath all of that is the human spirit. And that's where we, we seek God from deep within. We seek him, to know him, to love him, to serve him. Uh, Romans 1.9 says that we serve God with our spirit. So again, we serve God you know, uh, externally with a lot of activity and so on. But deep within, my service to God is the surrender of my spirit. When we are 
set apart, when we are sanctified, we were talking about 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and our spirit is set apart or sanctified, well, then there's there's statements in Scripture, I'm going to make passing reference to them, but we will be without guile, without deceit in our spirit. And we find that concept in Psalm 32 and verse 2. Um, we will be faithful in our spirit. And that's that Psalm 32 passage. Uh, Proverbs 11 and 13, we'll be humble in our spirit. Uh, we will rejoice in our spirit. We will be fervent in our spirit. We will be holy in our spirit. We will be meek in our spirit. I want you to get hold of, and I want to get hold of it in my own life, that again, my communion with God is first of all in my spirit. Now that will affect my soul, that will affect my body, but that is where I commune with God. Now, on the other side, the the spirit can be defeated. The spirit can be troubled. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. The spirit can be grieved. Daniel 7, verse 15. The spirit can be overwhelmed. Psalm 77. Job's spirit was anguished with all that he went through. You can have a haughty spirit. Deep within, you can have a pride problem. You can have a perverse spirit, Proverbs 15, 4, and your spirit can be defiled, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. One of the deep challenges regarding the spirit, I call it deep because I just sense this idea found in Proverbs 15, 17, and 18. The spirit can be wounded or broken. And the Bible says a a wounded spirit, a broken spirit, who can bear that? Who can handle that? Again, there's a difference between me being emotionally upset, that's soul, but to be broken in spirit just defeats and destroys. Thankfully, the spirit can be renewed Remember, David cried out for that in Psalm 51, having dealt with his sin. He said in prayer, asking God, renew a right spirit within me. It can be refreshed. It can be revived. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 talks about this work of God of reviving the spirit of the broken ones and the contrite ones. And we can be so broken and defeated through sin and through other problems, but praise the Lord, God can minister to us and can revive us. And you'll never get revival on the outside until you get it on the inside. And if you have it on the outside, not the inside, it's phony, it's surface, it's ultimately meaningless. Let me share with you a verse that I've often shared with people in counseling. And uh, it's, it's a very important one. It's Matthew 26 and verse 41. And here's what it it says. The Lord Jesus was talking to his disciples. He knew the pressures that were coming. He knew the testings that were coming to them. And uh, and they, they failed. When the Lord Jesus was taken to the cross, most of them ran and were hiding. They weren't there. Matthew 26, 41. The Lord Jesus said, watch, that means be alert, and pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, that you don't follow temptation, that you don't fall into sin. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And then he said this, because the Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And that sets up the battle that goes on uh, in 
our life as Christians. The battle between our human spirit, wanting, seeking to do right, but our flesh, that terrible aspect of our humanity, that that fallen proneness to sin of our humanity, uh, always wants to take us the wrong way. And boy, there's the raging conflict. And we're not going to go off on that tangent, but it's that reason that Paul writes in Galatians 5, walk in the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, letting him have his way. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the human spirit, listen, animals don't have a human spirit. You do. You are not an animal. In fact, the deepest part of your being is your human spirit. That's where the new birth occurs. And the Spirit of God will witness to you and give you that peace that you are a child of God. Now, it's interesting, too, by the way, that the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 that uh, no man knows the Spirit, the, the things of God, except the Spirit of God. And then he says, and no man knows the deep things of a man except the spirit of a man. You know, nobody else knows what's going on in the deepest part of you. And that can be difficult. That can be a challenge because when somebody finally sins openly, we wonder how long has that been working in the deepest part, the inner part of their being. Well, you know, nobody else may know, but you know the deep things of you. You know where you are in your relationship with God, where you are in your walk with God. You know whether or not the surface worship and activities and words and so on are phony and fake and shallow, or whether that kind of outward service and testimony is the reflection of the deepest part of your being. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 27 that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. What's that mean? It means the Holy Spirit will prompt our conscience toward guilt. And we need to take heed to our spirit when it affirms truth. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15, he gives a challenge there. Take heed to your spirit. In other words, you know the truth. You know what is right, and you need to act on it. And there's a lot of people who, who violate, really, the testimony and conviction of their own spirit because they know. They know that inside they're not right with God. They know that, but they play the game. They go ahead and do what they want to do anyway. So the human spirit, what an interesting aspect of our being. Now, there's another aspect of our being. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 talked about our spirit and our soul and our body. We're going to come back to soul, but I want to talk to you about our body. Uh, I was in 1 Corinthians six, a few moments ago, talking about uh, our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to come to that, but I want to back up a few verses to verse 13. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 13. Here's what Paul says there. He says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Okay, that's, that's how our life is lived. But God shall destroy both it and them. In other words, he said, you know, we live in the context of meat for the belly and the, and, the, and the belly for meat, but someday, he says, God is going to destroy it, the belly, and them, the meats. Someday all this human experience is uh, not going to be going on any longer. And then he makes this statement. Now he says, the body. So we're talking now about our body, my body, your body. He says, now the body is not 
for fornication. Fornication is a word that can be used in a technical sense. We're not going to get into that. It can be used in a very broad sense of immorality. And I want to tell you, we are living in a world that is immoral. And we're plunging deeper and deeper into immorality. And the immorality, of course, exposes itself and manifests itself in what we do with our body, how we talk, what we look at, what we listen to, what we do, where we go. It's all expressed and demonstrated and put on display through the body. So Paul says, now the body is not for fornication. Your body has not been given to you for the purposes of immorality, sexuality, sensuality. That's not why you have a body. I marvel at what people do. I marvel at how people dress. I I marvel at all of it, especially when some of this stuff shows up in the life of a Christian. Paul says the body is not for fornication. Now listen to the next little phrase. But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. I want you to think about that for a minute. Your body is for the Lord. Your body is to be controlled for the Lord. Your body is to be used for the Lord. We are in this world. We are not of this world. We are here sent by God for his purposes. And we need to understand that God has given us a body, and the reason for it is to honor the Lord. And that's why we jump down to verse 19 again, where Paul says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You know, God took up residence in the tabernacle. God took up residence in the temple. God is not resident in any physical buildings today. When we go to church, sometimes we refer to it as the house of God, but God is only there when he is there in 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 us. God has taken up residence in people. It's an amazing truth. That happened to you if you're saved. You didn't feel it happen when you got saved. I certainly didn't feel it when I got saved. But when you and I got saved, the Holy Spirit of God entered into us. He took up residence in us. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And Paul goes on and says in this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Holy Ghost is in you. You have the Holy Ghost of God, and you are not your own. And what's he mean by that? Your body is not your own. You're not your own. Verse 20, for you are bought with a price. The price was the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, we talked about glorifying God in your spirit, the deepest part of your being. God needs to be glorified and honored there. But he also says you need to glorify God in your body. What's it mean to glorify? Well, it means to to magnify, uh, to to lift up. Uh, to uh, the root of it is to to give weight to. Now, what's that mean? It means when somebody looks at me. And in this particular context, they look at my body. They look at me, what I say, how I live, how I dress, the whole thing. They look at me. Does that give forth a testimony for God? Are we magnifying God in our body? Are we glorifying God in our body? Are we, as it were, giving weight to God in our body? our body. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 
that if we wanted to really know the peace of God, then we would have to do that by having our whole being sanctified, set apart to God. He made reference to our spirit, to our soul, to our body. Next time, we're going to talk a little bit more about body, and then we're going to move on to soul. Lord bless you.